Chapter Six: Noel's Princess. She happened quite accidentally. We were not looking for a princess at all just then, but Noel had said he was going to find a princess all by himself and marry her, and he really did, which was rather odd because when people say things are going to befall, very often they don't. It was different, of course, with the prophets of old. We did not get any treasure by it except twelve chocolate drops, but we might have done, and it was an adventure anyhow. Greenwich Park is a jolly good place to play in, especially the parts that aren't near Greenwich. The parts near the heath are first rate. I often wish the park was nearer our house, but I suppose the park is a difficult thing to move. Sometimes we get Eliza to put lunch in a basket, and we go up to the park. She likes that; it saves cooking dinner for us. And sometimes she says of her own accord, "I've made some pasties for you, and you might as well go into the park as not. It's a lovely day." She always tells us to rinse out the cup at the drinking fountain, and the girls do. But I always put my head under the tap and drink. Then you're an intrepid hunter at a mountain stream, and besides, you're sure it's clean. Dicky does the same, and so does H.O. But Noel always drinks out of the cup. He says it is a golden goblet wrought by enchanted gnomes. The day the princess happened was a fine hot day last October, and we were quite tired with the walk up to the park. We always go in by the little gate at the top of Croom's Hill. It is the postern gate that things always happen at in stories. It was dusty walking, but when we got in the park it was ripping. So we rested a bit and lay on our backs and looked up at the trees and wished we could play monkeys. I have done it before now, but the park keeper makes a row if he catches you. When we'd rested a little, Alice said, "It was a long way to the enchanted wood, but it is very nice now we are there. I wonder what we shall find in it." "We shall find deer," said Dicky, "if we go to look. But they go on the other side of the park because of the people with buns." Saying buns made us think of lunch, so we had it, and when we had done, we scratched a hole under a tree and buried the papers, because we know it spoils pretty places to leave beastly, greasy papers lying about. I remember Mother teaching me and Dora that when we were quite little. I wish everybody's parents would teach them this useful lesson, and the same about orange peel. When we'd eaten everything there was, Alice whispered, "I see the white witch bear yonder among the trees. Let's track it and slay it in its lair." I'm the bear," said Noel. So he crept away, and we followed him among the trees. Often the witch bear was out of sight, and then you didn't know where it would jump out from. But sometimes we saw it and just followed. When we catch it, there'll be a great fight," said Oswald. "And I shall be Count Folco of Montfaucon. I'll be Gabriel," said Dora. She is the only one of us who likes doing girls' parts. "I'll be Sintram," said Alice. "And H.O. can be the little master. What about Dicky?" Oh, I can be the pilgrim with the bones," Psst, whispered Alice. "See his white fairy fur gleaming amid yonder covert, and I saw a bit of white too. It was Noel's collar, and it had come undone at the back. We hunted the bear in and out of the trees, and then we lost him altogether. And suddenly we found the wall of the park in a place where I'm sure there wasn't a wall before. Noel wasn't anywhere about, and there was a door in the wall, and it was open. So we went through. The bear has hidden himself in these mountain fastnesses," Oswald said. "I will draw my good sword in after him." So I drew the umbrella, which Dora always will bring in case it rains, because Noel gets a cold on the chest at the least thing, and we went on. The other side of the wall it was a stable yard, all cobblestones. There was nobody about, but we could hear a man rubbing down a horse and hissing in the stable. So we crept very quietly past, and Alice whispered, "It is the lair of the monster serpent. I hear his deadly hiss. Beware!" Courage and despatch. We went over the stones on tiptoe, and we found another wall with another door in it on the other side. We went through that too on tiptoe. It really was an adventure. And there we were in a shrubbery, and we saw something white through the trees. Dora said it was the white bear. That is so like Dora. She always begins to take part in a play just when the rest of us are getting tired of it. I don't mean this unkindly, because I am very fond of Dora. I cannot forget how kind she was when I had bronchitis, and ingratitude is a dreadful vice. But it is quite true. It is not a bear," said Oswald, and we all went on, still on tiptoe, round a twisty path and on to a lawn. And there was Noel. His collar had come undone, as I said, and he had an inky mark on his face that he made just before we left the house. And he wouldn't let Dora wash it off. And one of his bootlaces was coming down. He was standing looking at a little girl. She was the funniest little girl you ever saw. She was like a china doll, the sixpenny kind. She had a white face and long yellow hair done up very tight in two pigtails. Her forehead was very big and lumpy, and her cheeks came high up like little shelves under her eyes. Her eyes were small and blue. 
She had on a funny black frock, with curly braid on it, and button boots that went almost up to her knees. Her legs were very thin. She was sitting in a hammock chair nursing a blue kitten, not a sky blue one, of course, but the colour of a new slate pencil. As we came up, we heard her say to Noel, Who are you? Noel had forgotten about the bear, and he was taking his favourite part, so he said, I'm Prince Kamaralzaman. The funny little girl looked pleased. I thought at first you were a common boy, she said. Then she saw the rest of us and said, Are you all princesses and princes too? Of course we said yes, and she said, I am a princess also. She said it very well too, exactly as if it were true. We were very glad, because it is so seldom you meet any children who can begin to play right off without having everything explained to them. And even then they will say they are going to pretend to be a lion or a witch or a king. Now this little girl just said, I am a princess. Then she looked at Oswald and said, I fancy I've seen you at Baden. Of course Oswald said, Very likely. The little girl had a funny voice, and all her words were quite plain, each word by itself. She didn't talk at all like we do. H.O. asked her what the cat's name was, and she said, Katinka. Then Dicky said, Let's get away from the windows. If you play near windows, someone inside generally knocks at them and says, Don't. The princess put down the cat very carefully and said, I am forbidden to walk off the grass. That's a pity, said Dora. But I will if you like, said the princess. You mustn't do things you are forbidden to do, Dora said. But Dicky showed us that there was some more grass beyond the shrubs, with only a gravel path between. So I lifted the princess over the gravel, so that she should be able to say she hadn't walked off the grass. When we got to the other grass, we all sat down, and the princess asked us if we liked dragees. I know that's how you spell it, for I asked Albert next door's uncle. We said we thought not, but she pulled a real silver box out of her pocket and showed us. They were just flat, round chocolates. We had two each. Then we asked her her name, and she began, and when she began, she went on, and on, and on, till I thought she was never going to stop. H.O. said she had fifty names, but Dicky is very good at figures, and he says there were only eighteen. The first were Pauline, Alexandra, Alice, and Mary was one, and Victoria, for we all heard that, and it ended up with Hildegard Cunigond something or other, princess of something else. When she'd done, H.O. said, That's jolly good, say it again, and she did, but even then we couldn't remember it. We told her our names, but she thought they were too short. So when it was Noel's turn, he said he was Prince Noel Camaralzaman, Ivan Constantine Charlemagne, James, John, Edward, Biggs, Maximilian, Bastable, Prince of Lewisham. But when she asked him to say it again, of course, he could only get the first two names right, because he'd made it up as he went on. So the princess said, You are quite old enough to know your own name. She was very grave and serious. She told us that she was the fifth cousin of Queen Victoria. We asked who the other cousins were, but she did not seem to understand. She went on and said she was seven times removed. She couldn't tell us what that meant either, but Oswald thinks it means that the Queen's cousins are so fond of her that they will keep coming bothering, so the Queen's servants have orders to remove them. This little girl must have been very fond of the Queen to try so often to see her, and to have been seven times removed. We could see that it is considered something to be proud of, but we thought it was hard on the Queen that her cousins wouldn't let her alone. Presently the little girl asked us where our maids and governesses were. We told her we hadn't any just now, and she said, How pleasant! And did you come here alone? Yes, said Dora. We came across the heath. You are very fortunate, said the little girl. She sat very upright on the grass, with her fat little hands in her lap. I should like to go on the heath. There are donkeys there with white saddle covers. I should like to ride them, but my governess will not permit. I'm glad we haven't a governess, H.O. said. We ride the donkeys whenever we have any pennies, and once I gave the man another penny to make it gallop. You are indeed fortunate, said the princess again, and when she looked sad the shelves on her cheeks showed more than ever. You could have laid a sixpence on them quite safely if you had had one. Never mind, said Noel, I've got a lot of money. Come out and have a ride now. But the little girl shook her head and said she was afraid it would not be correct. Dora said she was quite right. Then all of a sudden came one of those uncomfortable times when nobody can think of anything to say, so we sat and looked at each other. But at last Alice said we ought to be going. Do not go yet, the little girl said. At what time did they order your carriage? Our carriage is a fairy one, drawn by griffins, and it comes when we wish for it, said Noel. The little girl looked at him very queerly and said, That is out of a picture book. Then Noel said he thought it was about time he was married if we were to be home in time for tea. The little girl was rather stupid over it, but she did what we told her, and we married them with Dora's pocket handkerchief for a veil, and the ring off the back of one of the buttons on H.O.'s blouse just went over her little finger. Then we showed her how to play cross-touch, 
and Puss in the Corner, and Tag. It was funny. She didn't know any games but Battledore and Shuttlecock and Les Grasse. But she really began to laugh at last, and not to look quite so like a doll. She was Puss, and was running after Dicky, when suddenly she stopped short and looked as if she was going to cry. And we looked, too, and there were two prim ladies with little mouths and tight hair. One of them said in quite an awful voice, "'Pauline, who are these children?' And her voice was gruff, with very curly R's. The little girl said we were princes and princesses, which was silly to a grown-up person that is not a great friend of yours. The gruff lady gave a short, horrid laugh, like a husky bark, and said, "'Princes, indeed!' They are only common children. Dora turned very red and began to speak, but the little girl cried out, "Common children! Oh, I'm so glad! When I'm grown up, I'll always play with common children." And she ran at us and began to kiss us one by one, beginning with Alice. She had got to H O when the horrid lady said, "Your Highness, go indoors at once." The little girl answered, "I won't." Then the prim lady said, "Wilson, carry her Highness indoors." And the little girl was carried away screaming and kicking with her little thin legs and her buttoned boots, and between her screams she shrieked, "Common children! I am glad, glad, glad! Common children! Common children!" The nasty lady then remarked, "Go at once, or I will send for the police." So we went. H O made a face at her, and so did Alice. But Oswald took off his cap and said he was sorry if she was annoyed about anything, for Oswald has always been taught to be polite to ladies, however nasty. Dicky took his off too when he saw me do it. He says he did it first, but that is a mistake. If I were really a common boy, I should say it was a lie. Then we all came away, and when we got outside, Dora said, "So she was really a princess. Fancy a princess living there. Even princesses have to live somewhere," said Dicky. And I thought it was play, and it was real. I wish I'd known. I should have liked to ask her lots of things," said Alice. H O said he would have liked to ask her what she had for dinner and whether she had a crown. I felt myself we had lost a chance of finding out a great deal about kings and queens. I might have known such a stupid-looking little girl would never have been able to pretend as well as that. So we all went home across the heath and made dripping toast for tea. When we were eating it, Noel said, "I wish I could give her some. It is very good." He sighed as he said it, and his mouth was very full. So we knew he was thinking of his princess. He says now that she was as beautiful as the day, but we remember her quite well, and she was nothing of the kind. End of chapter six. Chapter seven, being bandits. Noel was quite tiresome for ever so long after we found the princess. He would keep on wanting to go to the park when the rest of us didn't, and though we went several times to please him, we never found that door open again. And all of us, except him, knew from the first that it would be no go. So now we thought it was time to do something to rouse him from the stupor of despair, which is always done to heroes when anything baffling has occurred. Besides, we were getting very short of money again. The fortunes of your house cannot be restored, not so that they will last. That is, even by the one pound eight we got when we had the good hunting. We spent a good deal of that on presents for father's birthday. We got him a paperweight like a glass bun, with a picture of Lewisham Church at the bottom, and a blotting pad, and a box of preserved fruits, and an ivory penholder with a view of Greenwich Park in the little hole where you look through at the top. He was most awfully pleased and surprised, and when he heard how Noel and Oswald had earned the money to buy the things, he was more surprised still. Nearly all the rest of our money went to get fireworks for the fifth of November. We got six Catherine wheels and four rockets, two hand lights, one red and one green, a sixpenny maroon, two Roman candles. It cost a shilling. Some Italian streamers, a fairy fountain, and a tourbillon that cost eighteen pence and was very nearly worth it. But I think crackers and squibs are a mistake. It's true you get a lot of them for the money, and they're not bad fun for the first two or three dozen. But you get jolly sick of them before you've let off your sixpenneth, and the only amusing way is not allowed. It is putting them in the fire. It always seems a long time till the evening when you have got fireworks in the house, and I think as it was a rather foggy day, we should have decided to let them off directly after breakfast. Only father had said he would help us to let them off at eight o'clock after he had had his dinner, and you ought never to disappoint your father if you can help it. You see, we had three good reasons for trying H O's idea of restoring the fallen fortunes of our house by becoming bandits on the fifth of November. We had a fourth reason as well. And that was the best reason of the lot. You remember, Dora thought it would be wrong to be bandits. 
and the fifth of November came while Dora was away at Stroud, staying with her godmother. Stroud is in Gloucestershire. We were determined to do it while she was out of the way, because we did not think it wrong, and besides, we meant to do it anyhow. We held a council, of course, and laid our plans very carefully. We let H.O. be captain, because it was his idea. Oswald was lieutenant. Oswald was quite fair, because he let H.O. call himself captain. But Oswald is the eldest next to Dora, after all. Our plan was this. We were all to go up on to the heath. Our house is in the Lewisham Road, but it's quite close to the heath, if you cut up the short way opposite the confectioner's, past the nursery gardens and the cottage hospital, and turn to the left again and afterwards to the right. You come out then at the top of the hill, where the big guns are with the iron fence round them, and where the bands play on Thursday evenings in the summer. We were to lurk in ambush there, and waylay an unwary traveller. We were to call upon him to surrender his arms, and then bring him home, and put him in the deepest dungeon below the castle moat. Then we were to load him with chains, and send to his friends for ransom. You may think we had no chains, but you are wrong, because we used to keep two other dogs once, besides Pincher, before the fall of the fortunes of the ancient house of Bastable, and they were quite big dogs. It was latish in the afternoon before we started. We thought we could lurk better if it was nearly dark. It was rather foggy, and we waited a good while beside the railings, but all the belated travellers were either grown-up, or else they were board-school children. We weren't going to get into a row with grown-up people, especially strangers, and no true bandit would ever stoop to ask ransom from the relations of the poor and needy. So we thought it better to wait. As I said, it was Guy Fawkes Day, and if it had not been, we should never have been able to be bandits at all, for the unwary traveller we did catch had been forbidden to go out because he had a cold in his head. But he would run out to follow a guy, even without putting on a coat or a comforter, and it was a very damp, foggy afternoon, and nearly dark, so you see it was his own fault entirely, and served him jolly well right. We saw him coming over the heath, just as we were deciding to go home to tea. He had followed that guy right across to the village—we call Blackheath the village, I don't know why—and he was coming back, dragging his feet and sniffing. Psst! An unwary traveller approaches, whispered Oswald. Muffle your horses' heads, and see to the priming of your pistols, muttered Alice. She always will play boys' parts, and she makes Ellis cut her hair short on purpose. Ellis is a very obliging hairdresser. "'Steal softly upon him,' said Noel, "'for, lo, it is dusk, and no human eyes can mark our deeds.' So we ran out and surrounded the unwary traveller. It turned out to be Albert next door, and he was very frightened indeed until he saw who we were. "'Surrender!' hissed Oswald, in a desperate-sounding voice, as he caught the arm of the unwary. And Albert next door said, "'All right, I'm surrendering as hard as I can. You needn't pull my arm off.' We explained to him that resistance was useless, and I think he saw that from the first. We held him tight by both arms, and we marched him home down the hill in a hollow square of five. He wanted to tell us about the guy, but we made him see that it was not proper for prisoners to talk to the guard, especially about guys that the prisoner had been told not to go after because of his cold. When we got to where we live, he said, "'All right, I don't want to tell you. You'll wish I had afterwards. You never saw such a guy.' "'I can see you,' said H.O. It was very rude, and Oswald told him so at once, because it is his duty as an elder brother. But H.O. is very young, and does not know better yet. And besides, it wasn't bad for H.O. Albert next door said, "'You haven't any manners, and I want to go into my tea. Let go of me.' But Alice told him, quite kindly, that he was not going into his tea, but coming with us. "'I'm not,' said Albert next door. "'I'm going home. Leave go. I've got a bad cold. You're making it worse.' Then he tried to cough, which was very silly, because we'd seen him in the morning, and he'd told us where the cold was that he wasn't to go out with. When he had tried to cough, he said, "'Leave go of me! You see, my cold's getting worse!' "'You should have thought of that before,' said Dicky. "'You're coming in with us.' "'Don't be a silly,' said Noel. "'You know we told you at the very beginning that resistance was useless. There is no disgrace in yielding. We are five to your one.' By this time Eliza had opened the door, and we thought it best to take him in without any more parleying. To parley with a prisoner is not done by bandits. Directly we got him safe into the nursery, H.O. began to jump about and say, "'Now you are a prisoner, really and truly!' And Albert next door began to cry. He always does. I wonder he didn't begin long before. But Alice fetched him one of the dried fruits we gave Father for his birthday. It was a green walnut. I have noticed the walnuts and the plums always get left till the last in the box. The apricots go first, and then the figs and pears, and the cherries, if there are any. So he ate it and shut up. Then we explained his position to him, so that there could be no mistake, and he couldn't say afterwards that he had not understood. "'There will be no violence,' said Oswald. He was now captain of the bandits, because we all know H.O. likes to be chaplain when we play prisoners. "'No violence. 
but you will be confined in a dark subterranean dungeon, where toads and snakes crawl, and but little of the light of day filters through the heavily mullioned windows. You will be loaded with chains. Now don't begin again, baby, there's nothing to cry about. Straw will be your pallet. Beside you the jailer will set a ewer. A ewer is only a jug, stupid. It won't eat you. A ewer with water, and a mouldering crust will be your food. But Albert next door never enters into the spirit of the thing. He mumbled something about tea-time. Now Oswald, though stern, is always just, and besides we were all rather hungry, and tea was ready. So we had it at once, Albert next door and all, and we gave him what was left of the four-pound jar of apricot jam we got with the money Noel got for his poetry, and we saved our crusts for the prisoner. Albert next door was very tiresome. Nobody could have had a nicer prison than he had. We fenced him into a corner with the old wire nursery fender and all the chairs, instead of putting him in the coal cellar as we had first intended. And when he said the dog-chains were cold, the girls were kind enough to warm his fetters thoroughly at the fire before we put them on him. We got the straw cases of some bottles of wine someone sent father one Christmas. It is some years ago. But the cases are quite good. We unpacked them very carefully and pulled them to pieces and scattered the straw about. It made a lovely straw pallet, and took ever so long to make, but Albert next door has yet to learn what gratitude really is. We got the bread-trencher for the wooden platter, where the prisoners' crusts were put. They were not mouldy, but we could not wait till they got so, and for the ewer we got the toilet-jug out of the spare room where nobody ever sleeps. And even then Albert next door couldn't be happy like the rest of us. He howled and cried and tried to get out, and he knocked the ewer over and stamped on the mouldering crusts. Luckily there was no water in the ewer, because we had forgotten it, only dust and spiders. So we tied him up with the clothesline from the back kitchen, and we had to hurry up, which was a pity for him. We might have had him rescued by a devoted page if he hadn't been so tiresome. In fact, Noel was actually dressing up for the page when Albert next door kicked over the prison ewer. We got a sheet of paper out of an old exercise book, and we made H.O. prick his own thumb, because he is our little brother, and it is our duty to teach him to be brave. We none of us mind pricking ourselves. We've done it heaps of times. H.O. didn't like it, but he agreed to do it, and I helped him a little, because he was so slow. And when he saw the red bead of blood getting fatter and bigger as I squeezed his thumb, he was very pleased, just as I had told him he would be. This is what we wrote with H.O.'s blood. Only the blood gave out when we got to Restored, and we had to write the rest with Crimson Lake, which is not the same colour, though I always use it myself for painting wounds. While Oswald was writing it, he heard Alice whispering to the prisoner that it would soon be over, and it was only play. The prisoner left off howling, so I pretended not to hear what she said. A bandit captain has to overlook things sometimes. This was the letter. Albert Morrison is held prisoner by bandits. On payment of three thousand pounds, he will be restored to his sorrowing relatives, and all will be forgotten and forgiven. I was not sure about the last part, but Dicky was certain he had seen it in the paper, so I suppose it must have been all right. We let H.O. take the letter. It was only fair, as it was his blood it was written with, and told him to leave it next door for Mrs. Morrison. H.O. came back quite quickly, and Albert next door's uncle came with him. "'What's all this, Albert?' he cried. "'Alas, alas, my nephew, do I find you the prisoner of a desperate band of brigands?' "'Bandits,' said H.O. "'You know it says bandits.' "'I beg your pardon, gentlemen,' said Albert next door's uncle. "'Bandits it is, of course.' This, Albert, is the direct result of the pursuit of the guy on an occasion when your doting mother had expressly warned you to forgo the pleasures of the chase. Albert said it wasn't his fault, and he hadn't wanted to play. So ho, said his uncle, impenitent too. Where's the dungeon? We explained the dungeon, and showed him the straw pallet and the ewer, and the mouldering crusts and other things. Very pretty and complete, he said. Albert, you are more highly privileged than ever I was. No one ever made me a nice dungeon when I was your age. I think I had better leave you where you are. Albert began to cry again, and said he was sorry, and he would be a good boy. And on this old familiar basis you expect me to ransom you, do you? Honestly, my nephew, I doubt whether you are worth it. Besides, the sum mentioned in this document strikes me as excessive. Albert really is not worth three thousand pounds. Also, by a strange and unfortunate chance, I haven't the money about me. Couldn't you take less? We said perhaps we could. "'Say eightpence,' suggested Albert next door's uncle, "'which is all the small change I happen to have on my person. "'Thank you very much,' said Alice, as he held it out. "'But are you sure you can spare it? "'Because really it was only play.' "'Quite sure. "'Now, Albert, the game is over. "'You had better run home to your mother "'and tell her how much you've enjoyed yourself.' "'When Albert next door had gone, "'his uncle sat in the Guy Fawkes armchair "'and took Alice on his knee, "'and we sat around the fire waiting "'till it would be time to let off our fireworks.' 
We roasted the chestnuts he sent Dicky out for, and he told us stories till it was nearly seven. His stories are first-rate. He does all the parts in different voices. And at last he said, "'Look here, young uns. I like to see you play and enjoy yourselves. And I don't think it hurts Albert to enjoy himself, too.' "'I don't think he did much,' said H.O. "'But I knew what Albert next door's uncle meant, because I am much older than H.O. He went on. "'But what about Albert's mother? Didn't you think how anxious she would be at his not coming home? As it happens, I saw him come in with you, so we knew it was all right. But if I hadn't, eh? He only talks like that when he is very serious, or even angry. Other times he talks like people in books. To us, I mean. We none of us said anything. But I was thinking. Then Alice spoke. Girls seem not to mind saying things that we don't say. She put her arms around Albert next door's uncle's neck, and said, "'We're very, very sorry. We didn't think about his mother. You see, we try very hard not to think about other people's mothers, because—' Just then we heard father's key in the door, and Albert next door's uncle kissed Alice and put her down, and we all went down to meet father. As we went, I thought I heard Albert next door's uncle say something that sounded like, "'Poor little beggars! He couldn't have meant us, when we've been having such a jolly time, and chestnuts and fireworks to look forward to after dinner and everything.' End of chapter 7、Chapter、eight. Being Editors. It was Albert's uncle who thought of our trying a newspaper. He said he thought we should not find the bandit business a paying industry, as a permanency, and that journalism might be. We had sold Noel's poetry and that piece of information about Lord Tottenham to the good editor, so we thought it would not be a bad idea to have a newspaper of our own. We saw plainly that editors must be very rich and powerful, because of the grand office and the man in the glass case like a museum, and the soft carpets and big writing table. Besides our having seen a whole handful of money that the editor pulled out quite carelessly from his trousers pocket when he gave me my five bob. Dora wanted to be editor, and so did Oswald. But he gave way to her because she is a girl, and afterwards he knew that it is true what it says in the copy books about virtue being its own reward. Because you've no idea what a bother it is. Everybody wanted to put in everything just as they liked, no matter how much room there was on the page. It was simply awful. Dora put up with it as long as she could, and then she said if she wasn't let alone, she wouldn't go on being editor. They could be the paper's editors themselves, so there. Then Oswald said, like a good brother, I will help you if you like, Dora. And she said, You're more trouble than all the rest of them. Come and be editor and see how you like it. I give it up to you. But she didn't, and we did it together. We let Albert next door be sub editor because he had hurt his foot with a nail in his boot that gathered. When it was done, Albert next door's uncle had it copied for us in typewriting, and we sent copies to all our friends, and then, of course, there was no one left that we could ask to buy it. We did not think of that until too late. We called the paper the Lewisham Recorder. Lewisham because we live there, and recorder in memory of the good editor. I could write a better paper on my head, but an editor is not allowed to write all the paper. It is very hard. But he is not. You just have to fill up with what you can get from other writers. If I ever have time, I will write a paper all by myself. It won't be patchy. We had no time to make it an illustrated paper, but I drew the ship going down with all hands for the first copy. But the typewriter can't draw ships, so it was left out in the other copies. The time the first paper took to write out, no one would believe. This was the newspaper The Lewisham Recorder. Editors Dora and Oswald Bastable. Editorial note. Every paper is written for some reason. Ours is because we want to sell it and get money. If what we have written brings happiness to any sad heart, we shall not have laboured in vain. But we want the money too. Many papers are content with the sad heart and the happiness, but we are not like that, and it is best not to be deceitful. Editors. There will be two serial stories, one by Dicky and one by all of us. In a serial story, you only put in one chapter at a time, but we shall put all our serial story at once, if Dora has time to copy it. Dickie's will come later on. Serial story by us all. Chapter one by Dora. The sun was setting behind a romantic looking tower when two strangers might have been observed descending the crest of the hill. The eldest, a man in the prime of life, the other, a handsome youth who reminded every one of Quentin Durwood. They approached the castle, in which the fair Lady Alicia awaited her deliverers. She leaned from the castellated window and waved her lily hand as they approached. They returned her signal and retired to seek rest and refreshment at a neighbouring hostelry. Chapter two by Alice. 
The princess was very uncomfortable in the tower, because her fairy godmother had told her all sorts of horrid things would happen if she didn't catch a mouse every day, and she had caught so many mice that now there were hardly any left to catch. So she sent her carrier pigeon to ask the noble strangers if they could send her a few mice, because she would be of age in a few days, and then it wouldn't matter. So the fairy godmother, I'm very sorry, but there's no room to make the chapters any longer. E.D. Chapter three by the sub editor. I can't. I'd much rather not. I don't know how. Chapter four by Dicky. I must now retrace my steps and tell you something about our hero. You must know he had been to an awfully jolly school, where they had turkey and goose every day for dinner, and never any mutton, and as many helps of pudding as a fellow cared to send up his plate for. So, of course, they had all grown up very strong. And before he left school, he challenged the head to have it out man to man, and he gave it him, I tell you. That was the education that made him able to fight Red Indians, and to be the stranger who might have been observed in the first chapter. Chapter five by Noel. I think it's time something happened in this story. So then the dragon came out, blowing fire out of his nose, and he said, Come on, you valiant man and true, I'd like to have a set to along of you. That's bad English, E.D. I don't care. It's what the dragon said. Who told you dragons didn't talk bad English? Noel. So the hero, whose name was Noel on in Nuris, replied, My blade is sharp, my axe is keen. You're not nearly as big as a good many dragons I've seen. Don't put in so much poetry, Noel. It's not fair because none of the others can do it. E.D. And then they went at it, and he beat the dragon, just as he did the head in Dicky's part of the story, and so he married the princess, and they lived. No, they didn't. Not till the last chapter. E.D. Chapter six by H.O. I think it's a very nice story, but what about the mice? I don't want to say any more. Dora can have what's left of my chapter. Chapter seven by the editors. And so, when the dragon was dead, there were lots of mice, because he used to kill them for his tea, but now they rapidly multiplied and ravaged the country. So the fair lady Alicia, sometimes called the princess, had to say she would not marry any one unless they could rid the country of this plague of mice. Then the prince, whose real name didn't begin with N, but was Oswaraldo, waved his magic sword, and the dragon stood before them, bowing gracefully. They made him promise to be good, and then they forgave him. And when the wedding breakfast came, all the bones were saved for him. And so they were married and lived happily ever after. What became of the other stranger? Noel. The dragon ate him because he asked too many questions. Editors. This is the end of the story. Instructive. It only takes four hours and a quarter now to get from London to Manchester, but I should not think any one would if they could help it. A dreadful warning. A wicked boy told me a very instructive thing about ginger. They had opened one of the large jars, and he happened to take out quite a lot, and he made it all right by dropping marbles in till there was as much ginger as before. But he told me that on the Sunday, when it was coming near the part where there is only juice generally, I had no idea what his feelings were. I don't see what he could have said when they asked him. I should be sorry to act like it. Scientific experiments should always be made out of doors, and don't use benzoline. Dicky, that was when he burnt his eyebrows off. Ed. The Earth is two thousand four hundred miles round and eight hundred through. At least I think so, but perhaps it's the other way. Dicky, you ought to have been sure before you began. Ed. Scientific column. In this so-called nineteenth century, science is but too little considered in the nurseries of the rich and proud, but we are not like that. It is not generally known that if you put bits of camphor in lukewarm water, it will move about. If you drop sweet oil in, the camphor will dart away and then stop moving. But don't drop any till you are tired of it, because the camphor won't any more afterwards. Much amusement and instruction is lost by not knowing things like this. If you put a sixpence under a shilling in a wine glass and blow hard on the side of the glass, the sixpence will jump up and sit on the top of the shilling. At least, I can't do it myself, but my cousin can. He is in the navy. Answers to correspondence. Noel. You are very poetical, but I am sorry to say it will not do. Alice, nothing will ever make your hair curl, so it's no use. Some people say it's more important to tidy up as you go along. I don't mean you in particular, but every one. H O, we never said you were tubby, but the editor does not know any cure. Noel, if there is any of the paper over when this newspaper is finished, I will exchange it for your shut-up inkstand or the knife that has the useful thing in it for taking stones out of horses' feet. But you can't have it without. H O, 
There are many ways how your steam engine might stop working. You might ask Dicky. He knows one of them. I think it is the way yours stopped. Noel, if you think that by filling the garden with sand you can make crabs build their nests there, you are not at all sensible. You have altered your poem about the Battle of Waterloo so often that we cannot read it except where the Duke waves his sword and says something we can't read either. Why did you write it on blotting paper with purple chalk? E.D. Because you know who sneaked my pencil. Noel. Poetry. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and the way he came down was awful, I'm told. But it's nothing to the way one of the editors comes down on me if I crumble my bread and butter or spill my tea. Noel. Curious facts. If you hold a guinea pig up by his tail, his eyes drop out. You can't do half the things yourself that children in books do, making models or soon. I wonder why. Alice. If you take a date stone out and put in an almond and eat them together, it is prime. I found this out. Sub editor. If you put your wet hand into boiling lead, it will not hurt you if you draw it out quickly enough. I have never tried this. Dora. The purring class. Instructive article. If I ever keep a school, everything shall be quite different. Nobody shall learn anything they don't want to. And sometimes, instead of having masters and mistresses, we will have cats, and we will dress up in cat skins and learn purring. Now, my dears, the old cat will say, one, two, three, all purr together, and we shall purr like anything. She won't teach us to meow, but we shall know how without teaching. Children do know some things without being taught. Alice. Poetry. Translated into French by Dora. Quand j'étais jeune et j'étais fou, j'achetais un violon pour dix-huit sous. Et tous les airs que je jouais étaient over the hills and far away. Another piece of it. Merci, jolie vache qui fait bon lait pour mon déjeuner. Tous les matins, tous les soirs, mon pain je mange, ton lait je bois. Recreations. It is a mistake to think that cats are playful. I often try to get a cat to play with me, and she never seems to care about the game, no matter how little it hurts. H.O. Making pots and pans with clay is fun, but do not tell the grown-ups. It is better to surprise them, and then you must say at once how easily it washes off. Much easier than ink. Dicky. Sam Redfern, or the Bush Ranger's Burial, by Dicky. Well, Annie, I have bad news for you, said Mr. Ridgway as he entered the comfortable dining room of his cabin in the bush. Sam Redfern, the bush ranger, is about this part of the bush just now. I hope he will not attack us with his gang. I hope not, responded Annie, a gentle maiden of some sixteen summers. Just then came a knock at the door of the hut, and a gruff voice asked them to open the door. It is Sam Redfern, the bush ranger, father, said the girl. The same, responded the voice. And the next moment the hall door was smashed in, and Sam Redfern sprang in, followed by his gang. Chapter two. Annie's father was at once overpowered, and Annie herself lay bound with cords on the drawing room sofa. Sam Redfern set a guard round the lonely hut, and all human aid was despaired of. But you never know. Far away in the bush a different scene was being enacted. Must be Injuns, said a tall man to himself, as he pushed his way through the brushwood. It was Jim Carlton, the celebrated detective. I know them, he added. They are Apaches. Just then ten Indians in full war paint appeared. Carlton raised his rifle and fired, and slinging their scalps on his arm, he hastened towards the humble log hut where resided his affianced bride, Annie Ridgway, sometimes known as the Flower of the Bush. Chapter three. The moon was low on the horizon, and Sam Redfern was seated at a drinking bout with some of his boon companions. They had rifled the cellars of the hut, and the rich wines flowed like water in the golden goblets of Mr. Ridgway. But Annie had made friends with one of the gang, a noble, good-hearted man who had joined Sam Redfern by mistake, and she had told him to go and get the police as quickly as possible. Ha ha! cried Redfern. Now I am enjoying myself. He little knew that his doom was near upon him. Just then Annie gave a piercing scream, and Sam Redfern got up, seizing his revolver. Who are you? he cried as a man entered. I am Jim Carlton, the celebrated detective, said the new arrival. Sam Redfern's revolver dropped from his nerveless fingers, but the next moment he had sprung upon the detective with the well known activity of the mountain sheep, and Annie shrieked, for she had grown to love the rough bush ranger. To be continued at the end of the paper, if there is room. Scholastic. 
A new slate is horrid till it is washed in milk. I like the green spots on them to draw patterns round. I know a good way to make a slate pencil squeak, but I won't put it in because I don't want to make it common. Sub editor. Peppermint is a great help with arithmetic. The boy who was second in the Oxford local always did it. He gave me two. The examiner said to him, Are you eating peppermints? And he said, No, sir. He told me afterwards that it was quite true, because he was only sucking one. I'm glad I wasn't asked. I should never have thought of that, and I could have had to say yes. Oswald. The Wreck of the Malabar by Noel. Author of A Dream of Ancient Ancestors. He isn't really, but he put it in to make it seem more real. Hark! What is that noise of rolling waves and thunder in the air? Tis the death knell of the sailors and officers and passengers of the good ship Malabar. It was a fair and lovely noon when the good ship put out of port, and people said, Ah, little we think how soon she will be the element's sport. She was indeed a lovely sight upon the billows with sails spread, but the captain folded his gloomy arms, Ah, if she had been a lifeboat instead. See the captain, stern yet gloomy, flings his son upon a rock, hoping that there his darling boy may escape the wreck. Alas, in vain the loud winds roared, and nobody was saved. That was the wreck of the Malabar. Then let us toll for the brave. Noel. Gardening Notes. It is useless to plant cherry stones in the hope of eating the fruit, because they don't. Alice won't lend her gardening tools again, because the last time Noel left them out in the rain, and I don't like it. He said he didn't. Seeds and bulbs. These are useful to play at shop with, until you are ready. Not at dinner parties, for they will not grow unless uncooked. Potatoes are not grown with seed, but with chopped up potatoes. Apple trees are grown from twigs, which is less wasteful. Oak trees come from acorns, everyone knows this. When Noel says he could grow one from a peach stone wrapped up in oak leaves, he shows that he knows nothing about gardening but marigolds, and when I passed by his garden I thought they seemed just like weeds now the flowers had been picked. A boy once dared me to eat a bulb. Dogs are very industrious and fond of gardening. Pincher is always planting bones, but they never grow up. There couldn't be a bone tree. I think this is what makes him bark so unhappily at night. He has never tried planting dog biscuit, but he is fonder of bones, and perhaps he wants to be quite sure about them first. Sam Redfern or the Bush Ranger's Burial by Dickie. Chapter four and last. This would have been a jolly good story if they had let me finish it at the beginning of the paper as I wanted to. But now I have forgotten how I meant it to end, and I have lost my book about Red Indians, and all my boys of England have been sneaked. The girls say good riddance, so I expect they did it. They want me just to put in which Annie married, but I shan't, so they will never know. We have now put everything we can think of into the paper. It takes a lot of thinking about. I don't know how grown-ups manage to write all they do. It must make their heads ache, especially lesson books. Albert next door only wrote one chapter of the serial story, but he could have done some more if he had wanted to. He could not write out any of the things because he cannot spell. He says he can, but it takes him such a long time he might just as well not be able. There are one or two things more. I am sick of it, but Dora says she will write them in. Legal answer wanted. A quantity of excellent string is offered if you know whether there really is a law passed about not buying gunpowder under thirteen. Dicky. The price of this paper is one shilling each, and sixpence extra for the picture of the Malabar going down with all hands. If we sell one hundred copies, we will write another paper. And so we would have done. But we never did. Albert next door's uncle gave us two shillings. That was all. You can't restore fallen fortunes with two shillings. End of chapter 8、chapter、The GB Being editors is not the best way to wealth. We all feel this now. And highwaymen are not respected any more like they used to be. I am sure we had tried our best to restore our fallen fortunes. We felt their fall very much, because we knew the Bastables had been rich once. Dora and Oswald can remember when father was always bringing nice things home from London, and there used to be turkeys and geese and wine and cigars come by the carrier at Christmas time, and boxes of candied fruit and French plums in ornamental boxes with silk and velvet and gilding on them. They were called prunes, but the prunes you buy at the grocer's are quite different. But now there is seldom anything nice brought from London. And the turkey and the prune people have forgotten father's address. 
"'How can we restore those beastly fallen fortunes?' said Oswald. "'We've tried digging and writing and princesses and being editors.' "'And being bandits,' said H.O. "'When did you try that?' asked Dora quickly. "'You know I told you it was wrong.' "'It wasn't wrong the way we did it,' said Alice, quicker still, before Oswald could say, "'Who asked you to tell us anything about it?' which would have been rude, and he is glad he didn't. "'We only caught Albert next door.' "'Oh, Albert next door,' said Dora contemptuously, and I felt more comfortable. For even after I didn't say, "'Who asked you?' etc., I was afraid Dora was going to come the good elder sister over us. She does that a jolly sight too often. Dicky looked up from the paper he was reading and said, "'This sounds likely,' and he read out, "'One hundred pounds secures partnership and lucrative business for sale of useful patent. Ten pounds weekly. No personal attendance necessary. Jobbins, three hundred, Old Street Road.' "'I wish we could secure that partnership,' said Oswald. "'He is twelve, and a very thoughtful boy for his age.' Alice looked up from her painting. She was trying to paint a fairy queen's frock with green bice, but it wouldn't rub. There is something funny about green bice. It never will rub off, no matter how expensive your paint-box is, and even boiling water is very little use. She said, "'Bother the bice! And, Oswald, it's no use thinking about that. Where are we to get a hundred pounds?' Ten pounds a week is five pounds to us,' Oswald went on. He had done the sum in his head while Alice was talking. "'Because partnership means halves. It would be A1.' Noel sat sucking his pencil. He had been writing poetry as usual. I saw the first two lines. "'I wonder why green bice is never very nice.' Suddenly he said, "'I wish a fairy would come down the chimney and drop a jewel on the table. A jewel worth just a hundred pounds.' "'She might as well give you the hundred pounds while she was about it,' said Dora. "'Or while she was about it, she might as well give us five pounds a week,' said Alice. "'Or fifty, said I. "'Or five hundred, said Dicky. "'I saw H.O. open his mouth. "'I knew he was going to say, or five thousand. "'So I said, "'Well, she won't give us five pence. "'But if he'd only do as I'm always saying, "'and rescue a wealthy old gentleman from deadly peril, "'he would give us a pot of money, "'and we could have the partnership and five pounds a week. Five pounds a week would buy a great many things. "'Then Dicky said, "'Why shouldn't we borrow it?' So we said, "'Who from?' And then he read this out of the paper. "'Money privately without fees. The Bond Street Bank. Manager, Z. Rosenbaum. Advances cash from twenty pounds to ten thousand pounds, on ladies' or gentlemen's note of hand alone, without security. No fees, no inquiries. Absolute privacy guaranteed.' "'What does it all mean?' asked H.O. It means that there is a kind gentleman who has a lot of money, and he doesn't know enough poor people to help, so he puts it in the paper that he will help them by lending them his money. That's it, isn't it, Dicky? Dora explained this, and Dicky said, yes. And H.O. said he was a generous benefactor, like in Miss Edgeworth. Then Noel wanted to know what a note of hand was, and Dicky knew that, because he had read it in a book, and it was just a letter saying you will pay the money when you can, and signed with your name. No inquiries, said Alice. Oh, Dicky, do you think he would? "'Yes, I think so,' said Dicky. "'I wonder father doesn't go to this kind gentleman. "'I've seen his name before in a circular in father's study.' "'Perhaps he has,' said Dora. "'But the rest of us were sure he hadn't, "'because, of course, if he had, "'there would have been more money to buy nice things.' "'Just then Pincher jumped up and knocked over the painting-water. "'He's a very careless dog. "'I wonder why painting-water is always such an ugly colour. "'Dora ran for a duster to wipe it up, "'and H.O. dropped drops of the water on his hands "'and said he had got the plague.' So we played at the plague for a bit, and I was an Arab physician with a bath-towel turban, and cured the plague with magic acid drops. After that it was time for dinner, and after dinner we talked it all over and settled that we would go and see the generous benefactor the very next day. But we thought perhaps the G.B.—it is short for generous benefactor—would not like it if there were so many of us. I have often noticed that it is the worst of our being six. People think six a great many when it's children. That sentence looks wrong somehow. I mean, they don't mind six pairs of boots, or six pounds of apples, or six oranges, especially in equations, but they seem to think you ought not to have five brothers and sisters. Of course, Dicky was to go, because it was his idea. Dora had to go to Blackheath to see an old lady, a friend of father's, so she couldn't go. Alice said she ought to go, because it said ladies and gentlemen, and perhaps the G.B. wouldn't let us have the money unless there were both kinds of us. H.O. said Alice wasn't a lady, and she said he wasn't going anyway. Then he called her a disagreeable cat, and she began to cry. But Oswald always tries to make up quarrels, so he said, "'You're little sillies, both of you.' And Dora said, "'Don't cry, Alice. He only meant you weren't a grown-up lady.' 
Then H.O. said, "'What else did you think I meant, disagreeable?' So Dicky said, "'Don't be disagreeable yourself, H.O. Let her alone and say you're sorry, or I'll jolly well make you.' So H.O. said he was sorry. Then Alice kissed him and said she was sorry, too. And after that H.O. gave her a hug and said, "'Now I'm really and truly sorry.' So it was all right. Noel went the last time any of us went to London, so he was out of it. And Dora said she would take him to Blackheath if we'd take H.O. So as there'd been a little disagreeableness, we thought it was better to take him, and we did. At first we thought we'd tear our oldest things a bit more, and put some patches of different colours on them, to show the G.B. how much we wanted money. But Dora said that would be a sort of cheating, pretending we were poorer than we are. And Dora is right sometimes, though she is our eldest sister. Then we thought we'd better wear our best things, so that the G.B. might see we weren't so very poor that he couldn't trust us to pay his money back when we had it. But Dora said that would be wrong, too. So it came to our being quite honest, as Dora said, and going just as we were, without even washing our faces and hands. But when I looked at H.O. on the train, I wished we had not been quite so particularly honest. Every one who reads this knows what it is like to go in the train, so I shall not tell about it, though it was rather fun, especially the part where the guard came for our tickets at Waterloo, and H.O. was under the seat and pretended to be a dog without a ticket. We went to Charing Cross, and we just went round to Whitehall to see the soldiers, and then by St. James for the same reason. And when we'd looked in the shops a bit, we got to Brook Street, Bond Street. It was a brass plate on a door next to a shop, a very grand place, where they sold bonnets and hats, all very bright and smart, and no tickets on them to tell you the price. We rang a bell, and a boy opened the door, and we asked for Mr. Rosenbaum. The boy was not polite. He did not ask us in. So then Dicky gave him his visiting card. It was one of father's, really, but the name is the same, Mr. Richard Bastable, and we others wrote our names underneath. I happened to have a piece of pink chalk in my pocket, and we wrote them with that. Then the boy shut the door in our faces, and we waited on the step. But presently he came down and asked our business, so Dicky said, "'Money advanced, young shaver, and don't be all day about it.' And then he made us wait again, till I was quite stiff in my legs. But Alice liked it because of looking at the hats and bonnets. And at last the door opened, and the boy said, "'Mr. Rosenbaum will see you.' So we wiped our feet on the mat, which said so, and we went upstairs with soft carpets and into a room. It was a beautiful room. I wished then we had put on our best things, or at least washed a little. But it was too late now. The room had velvet curtains and a soft, soft carpet, and it was full of the most splendid things black and gold cabinets and china and statues and pictures. There was a picture of a cabbage and a pheasant and a dead hare that was just like life, and I would have given worlds to have it for my own. The fur was so natural I should never have been tired of looking at it, but Alice liked the one of the girl with the broken jug best. Then besides the pictures there were clocks and candlesticks and vases and gilt looking-glasses and boxes of cigars and scent and things littered all over the chairs and tables. It was a wonderful place, and in the middle of all the splendour was a little old gentleman with a very long black coat and a very long white beard and a hooky nose like a falcon. And he put on a pair of gold spectacles and looked at us as if he knew exactly how much our clothes were worth. And then, while we elder ones were thinking how to begin, for we had all said good morning as we came in, of course, H.O. began before we could stop him. He said, "'Are you the G.B.?' "'The what?' said the little old gentleman. "'The G.B.' said H.O., and I winked at him to shut up, but he didn't see me, and the G.B. did. He waved his hand at me to shut up, so I had to, and H.O. went on. "'It stands for generous benefactor.' The old gentleman frowned. Then he said, "'Your father sent you here, I suppose?' "'No, he didn't,' said Dicky. "'Why did you think so?' The old gentleman held out the card, and I explained that we took that because father's name happens to be the same as Dicky's. "'Doesn't he know you've come?' "'No,' said Alice. "'We shan't tell him till we've got our partnership, because his own business worries him a good deal, and we don't want to bother him with ours till it's settled, and then we shall give him half our share.' The old gentleman took off his spectacles and rumpled his hair with his hands. Then he said, "'Then what did you come for?' "'We saw your advertisement,' Dicky said, "'and we want a hundred pounds on our note of hand, and my sister came so that there should be both kinds of us, and we wanted to buy a partnership with in the lucrative business for sale of useful patent. No personal attendance necessary.' "'I don't think I quite follow you,' said the G.B., "'but one thing I should like settled before entering more fully into the matter. "'Why did you call me generous benefactor?' "'Well, you see,' said Alice, smiling at him to show she wasn't frightened, though I know really she was, awfully. "'We thought it was so very kind of you to try to find out the poor people who want money, and to help them and lend them your money.' "'Hm,' said the G.B. "'Sit down.' 
He cleared the clocks and vases and candlesticks off some of the chairs, and we sat down. The chairs were velvety with gilt legs. It was like a king's palace. Now, he said, you ought to be at school instead of thinking about money. Why aren't you? We told him that we should go to school again when father could manage it, but meantime we wanted to do something to restore the fallen fortunes of the House of Bastable, and we said we thought the lucrative patent would be a very good thing. He asked a lot of questions, and we told him everything we didn't think father would mind our telling, and at last he said, You wish to borrow money. When will you repay it? As soon as we've got it, of course, Dicky said. Then the GB said to Oswald, You seem the eldest. But I explained to him that it was Dicky's idea, so my being eldest didn't matter. Then he said to Dicky, You are a miner, I presume. Dicky said he wasn't yet, but he had thought of being a mining engineer some day and going to Klondike. Miner, not miner. Said the GB. I mean, you're not of age. I shall be in ten years, though, said Dicky. Then you might repudiate the loan, said the GB. And Dicky said, What? Of course, he ought to have said, I beg your pardon. I didn't quite catch what you said. That is what Oswald would have said. It is more polite than what. Repudiate the loan, the GB repeated. I mean, you might say you would not pay me back the money, and the law could not compel you to do so. Oh, well, if you think we're such sneaks. Said Dicky, and he got up off his chair. But the GB said, Sit down, sit down, I was only joking. Then he talked some more, and at last he said, I don't advise you to enter into that partnership. It's a swindle. Many advertisements are. And I have not a hundred pounds by me to day to lend you. But I will lend you a pound, and you can spend it as you like. And when you are twenty one, you shall pay me back. I shall pay you back long before that, said Dicky. Thanks awfully. And what about the note of hand? Oh, said the GB, I'll trust your honour. Between gentlemen, you know, and ladies, he made a beautiful bow to Alice, a word is as good as a bond. Then he took out a sovereign and held it in his hand while he talked to us. He gave us a lot of good advice about not going into business too young and about doing our lessons, just swatting a bit on our own hook, so as not to be put in a low form when we went back to school. And all the time he was stroking the sovereign and looking at it as if he thought it very beautiful. And so it was, for it was a new one. Then at last he held it out to Dicky. And when Dicky put out his hand for it, the GB suddenly put the sovereign back in his pocket. No, he said, I won't give you the sovereign. I'll give you fifteen shillings and this nice bottle of scent. It's worth far more than the five shillings I'm charging you for it. And when you can, you shall pay me back the pound and sixty per cent interest. Sixty per cent? Sixty per cent. What's that? said H.O. The GB said he'd tell us that when we paid back the sovereign, but sixty per cent was nothing to be afraid of. He gave Dicky the money, and the boy was made to call a cab, and the GB put us in and shook hands with us all, and asked Alice to give him a kiss. So she did, and H.O. would do it too, though his face was dirtier than ever. The GB paid the cabman and told him what station to go to, and so we went home. That evening, father had a letter by the seven o'clock post. And when he had read it, he came up into the nursery. He did not look quite so unhappy as usual, but he looked grave. You've been to Mr. Rosenbaum's, he said. So we told him all about it. It took a long time, and father sat in the armchair. It was jolly. He doesn't often come and talk to us now. He has to spend all his time thinking about his business. And when we told him all about it, he said, You haven't done any harm this time, children. Rather good than harm, indeed. Mr. Rosenbaum has written me a very kind letter. Is he a friend of yours, father? Oswald asked. He is an acquaintance, said my father, frowning a little. We have done some business together. And this letter. He stopped, and then said, No, you didn't do any harm to day. But I want you for the future not to do anything so serious as to try to buy a partnership without consulting me, that's all. I don't want to interfere with your plays and pleasures, but you will consult me about business matters, won't you? Of course, we said we should be delighted, but then Alice, who was sitting on his knee, said, We didn't like to bother you. Father said, I haven't much time to be with you, for my business takes most of my time. It is an anxious business, but I can't bear to think of your being left all alone like this. He looked so sad, we all said we liked being alone, and then he looked sadder than ever. Then Alice said, We don't mean that exactly, Father. It is rather lonely sometimes since Mother died. Then we were all quiet a little while. Father stayed with us till we went to bed, and when he said good night, he looked quite cheerful. So we told him so, and he said, Well, the fact is, that letter took a weight off my mind. 
I can't think what he meant. But I am sure the G.B. would be pleased if he could know he had taken a weight off somebody's mind. He is that sort of man, I think. We gave the scent to Dora. It is not quite such good scent as we thought it would be. But we had fifteen shillings, and they were all good. So is the G.B. And until those fifteen shillings were spent, we felt almost as jolly as though our fortunes had been properly restored. You do not notice your general fortune so much, as long as you have money in your pocket. This is why so many children with regular pocket money have never felt it their duty to seek for treasure. So perhaps our not having pocket money was a blessing in disguise. But the disguise was quite impenetrable, like the villains in books, and it seemed still more so when the fifteen shillings were all spent. Then at last the others agreed to let Oswald try his way of seeking for treasure, but they were not at all keen about it and many a boy less firm than Oswald would have chucked the whole thing. But Oswald knew that a hero must rely on himself alone, so he stuck to it, and presently the others saw their duty and backed him up. End of chapter 9、Chapter、10. Lord Tottenham Oswald is a boy of firm and unswerving character, and he had never wavered from his first idea. He felt quite certain that the books were right, and that the best way to restore fallen fortunes was to rescue an old man in distress. Then he brings you up as his own son, but if you preferred to go on being your own father's son, I expect the old gentleman would make it up to you some other way. In the books, the least thing does it. You put up the railway carriage window, or you pick up his purse when he drops it, or you say a hymn when he suddenly asks you to, and then your fortune is made. The others, as I said, were very slack about it, and did not seem to care much about trying the rescue. They said there wasn't any deadly peril, and we should have to make one before we could rescue the old gentleman from it, but Oswald didn't see that that mattered. However, he thought he would try some of the easier ways first, by himself. So he waited about the station, pulling up railway carriage windows for old gentlemen who looked likely, but nothing happened, and at last the porters said he was a nuisance, so that was no go. No one ever asked him to say a hymn. Though he had learned a nice short one, beginning new every morning, and when an old gentleman did drop a two shilling piece just by Ellis's the hairdresser's, and Oswald picked it up and was just thinking what he should say when he returned it, the old gentleman caught him by the collar and called him a young thief. It would have been very unpleasant for Oswald if he hadn't happened to be a very brave boy and knew the policeman on that beat very well indeed. So the policeman backed him up, and the old gentleman said he was sorry, and offered Oswald sixpence. Oswald refused it with polite disdain, and nothing more happened at all. When Oswald had tried by himself, and it had not come off, he said to the others, We're wasting our time, not trying to rescue the old gentleman in deadly peril. Come, buck up. Do let's do something. It was dinner time, and Pincher was going round getting the bits off the plates. There were plenty, because it was cold mutton day. And Alice said, It's only fair to try Oswald's way. He has tried all the things the others thought of. Why couldn't we rescue Lord Tottenham? Lord Tottenham is the old gentleman he walks over the heath every day in a paper collar at three o'clock, and when he gets half way, if there is no one about, he changes his collar and throws the dirty one into the furze bushes. Dicky said, Lord Tottenham's all right, but where's the deadly peril? But we couldn't think of any. There are no highwaymen on Blackheath now, I'm sorry to say, and though Oswald said half of us could be highwaymen and the other half rescue party, Dora kept on saying it would be wrong to be a highwayman, so we had to give that up. Then Alice said, What about Pincher? We all saw at once that it could be done. Pincher is very well bred, and he does know one or two things, though we never could teach him to beg. But if you tell him to hold on, he will do it, even if you only say, Seize him in a whisper. So we arranged it all. Dora said she wouldn't play. She said she thought it was wrong, and she knew it was silly, so we left her out, and she went and sat in the dining room with a goody book, so as to be able to say she didn't have anything to do with it if we got into a row over it. Alice and H.O. were to hide in the furze bushes just by where Lord Tottenham changes his collar, and they were to whisper, Seize him, to Pincher. And then, when Pincher had seized Lord Tottenham, we were to go and rescue him from his deadly peril. And he would say, How can I reward you, my noble young preservers? And it would be all right. So we went up to the heath. We were afraid of being late. Oswald told the others what procrastination was, so they got to the furze bushes a little after two o'clock, and it was rather cold. Alice and H.O. and Pincher hid, but Pincher did not like it any more than they did, and as we three walked up and down, we heard him whining. And Alice kept saying, I am so cold. Isn't he coming yet? And H.O. wanted to come out and jump about to warm himself. But we told him he must learn to be a Spartan boy, and that he ought to be very thankful he hadn't got a beastly fox eating his inside all the time. H.O. is our little brother, and we are not going to let it be our fault if he grows up a milksop. Besides, it was not really cold. 
It was his knees. He wears socks. So they stayed where they were. And at last, when even the other three who were walking about were beginning to feel rather chilly, we saw Lord Tottenham's big black cloak coming along, flapping in the wind like a great bird. So we said to Alice, Psst! He approaches! You'll know when to set Pincher on by hearing Lord Tottenham talking to himself. He always does while he's taking off his collar. Then we three walked slowly away, whistling to show we were not thinking of anything. Our lips were rather cold, but we managed to do it. Lord Tottenham came striding along, talking to himself. People call him the Mad Protectionist. I don't know what it means. But I don't think people ought to call a lord such names. As he passed us, he said, "'Ruin of the country, sir! Fatal error! Fatal error!' And then we looked back, and saw he was getting quite near where Pincher was, and Alice and H.O. We walked on, so that he shouldn't think we were looking, and in a minute we heard Pincher's bark, and then nothing for a bit. And then we looked round, and sure enough, good old Pincher had got Lord Tottenham by the trouser-leg, and was holding on like billy-ho. So we started to run. Lord Tottenham had got his collar half off. It was sticking out sideways under his ear, and he was shouting, "'Help! Help! Murder!' exactly as if someone had explained to him beforehand what he was to do. Pincher was growling and snarling and holding on. When we got to him, I stopped and said, "Dicky, we must rescue this good old man.' Lord Tottenham roared in his fury, "'Good old man be something or other. Call the dog off!' So Oswald said, "'It is a dangerous task, but who would hesitate to do an act of true bravery?' And all the while Pincher was worrying and snarling, and Lord Tottenham shouting to us to get the dog away. He was dancing about in the road, with Pincher hanging on like grim death, and his collar flapping about where it was undone. Then Noel said, "'Haste, ere yet it be too late!' So I said to Lord Tottenham, "'Stand still, aged sir, and I will endeavour to alleviate your distress.' He stood still, and I stooped down and caught hold of Pincher and whispered, "'Drop it, sir! Drop it!' So then Pincher dropped it, and Lord Tottenham fastened his collar again. He never does change it if there's anyone looking, and he said, "'I'm much obliged, I'm sure. Nasty, vicious brute! Here's something to drink my health.' But Dicky explained that we are teetotalers, and do not drink people's healths. So Lord Tottenham said, "'Well, I'm much obliged, anyway. And now I come to look at you. Of course you're not young ruffians, but gentlemen's sons, eh? Still you won't be above taking a tip from an old boy.' I wasn't when I was your age, and he pulled out half a sovereign. It was very silly, but now we'd done it, I felt it would be beastly mean to take the old boy's chink after putting him in such a funk. He didn't say anything about bringing us up as his own sons, so I didn't know what to do. I let Pincher go and was just going to say he was very welcome and we'd rather not have the money, which seemed the best way out of it, when that beastly dog spoiled the whole show. Directly I let him go, he began to jump about at us and bark for joy and try to lick our faces. He was so proud of what he'd done. Lord Tottenham opened his eyes, and he just said, "'The dog seems to know you.' And then Oswald saw it was all up, and he said, "'Good morning,' and tried to get away. But Lord Tottenham said, "'Not so fast,' and he caught Noel by the collar. Noel gave a howl, and Alice ran out from the bushes. Noel is her favourite. I'm sure I don't know why. Lord Tottenham looked at her, and he said, "'So there are more of you.' And then H.O. came out. "'Do you complete the party?' Lord Tottenham asked him, and H.O. said there were only five of us this time. Lord Tottenham turned sharp off and began to walk away, holding Noel by the collar. We caught up with him, and asked him where he was going, and he said, "'To the police station.' So then I said quite politely, "'Well, don't take Noel. He's not strong, and he easily gets upset. Besides, it wasn't his doing. If you want to take anyone, take me. It was my very own idea.' Dicky behaved very well. He said, "'If you take Oswald, I'll go too. But don't take Noel. He's such a delicate little chap.' Lord Tottenham stopped, and he said, "'You should have thought of that before.' Noel was howling all the time, and his face was very white, and Alice said, "'Oh, do let Noel go, dear, good, kind Lord Tottenham. He'll faint if you don't. I know he will. He does sometimes. Oh, I wish we'd never done it. Dora said it was wrong.' "'Dora displayed considerable common sense,' said Lord Tottenham, and he let Noel go. And Alice put her arm around Noel and tried to cheer him up, but he was all trembly and as white as paper. Then Lord Tottenham said, "'Will you give me your word of honour not to try to escape?' So we said we would." "'Then follow me,' he said, and led the way to a bench. We all followed, and Pincher, too, with his tail between his legs. He knew something was wrong. Then Lord Tottenham sat down, and he made Oswald and Dicky and H.O. stand in front of him, but he let Alice and Noel sit down, and he said, "'You set your dog on me, and you tried to make me believe you were saving me from it. And you would have taken my half-sovereign. Such conduct is most—no. You shall tell me what it is, sir, and speak the truth.' So I had to say it was most ungentlemanly, but I said I hadn't been going to take the half-sovereign. "'Then what did you do it for?' he asked. "'The truth, mind.' So I said, "'I see now it was very silly, and Dora said it was wrong, but it didn't seem so till we did it. 
We wanted to restore the fallen fortunes of our house, and in the books, if you rescue an old gentleman from deadly peril, he brings you up as his own son, or if you prefer to be your father's son, he starts you in business, so that you end in wealthy affluence. And there wasn't any deadly peril, so we made Pincher into one. And so I was so ashamed I couldn't go on, for it did seem an awfully mean thing. Lord Tottenham said, A very nice way to make your fortune, by deceit and trickery. I have a horror of dogs. If I'd been a weak man, the shock might have killed me. What do you think of yourselves, eh? We were all crying except Oswald, and the others say he was. And Lord Tottenham went on, Well, well, I see you're sorry. Let this be a lesson to you, and we'll say no more about it. I'm an old man now, but I was young once. Then Alice slid along the bench close to him, and put her hand on his arm. Her fingers were pink through the holes in her woolly gloves, and said, I think you're very good to forgive us, and we are really very, very sorry. But we wanted to be like the children in the books, only we never have the chances they have. Everything they do turns out all right. But we are sorry, very, very. And I know Oswald wasn't going to take the half sovereign. Directly you said that about a tip from an old boy, I began to feel bad inside, and I whispered to H.O. that I wished we hadn't. Then Lord Tottenham stood up, and he looked like the death of Nelson, for he is clean shaved, and it is a good face, and he said, Always remember, never to do a dishonourable thing, for money or for anything else in the world. And we promised we would remember. Then he took off his hat, and we took off ours, and he went away, and we went home. I never felt so cheap in all my life. Dora said, I told you so, but we didn't mind even that so much, though it was indeed hard to bear. It was what Lord Tottenham had said about ungentlemanly. We didn't go on the heath for a week after that, but at last we all went, and we waited for him by the bench. When he came along, Alice said, Please, Lord Tottenham, we have not been on the heath for a week to be a punishment because you let us off. But we have brought you a present each if you will take them to show you are willing to make it up. He sat down on the bench and we gave him our presents. Oswald gave him a sixpenny compass. He bought it with my own money on purpose to give him. Oswald always buys useful presents. The needle would not move after I'd had it a day or two, but Lord Tottenham used to be an admiral, so he will be able to make that go all right. Alice had made him a shaving case with a rose worked on it, and H.O. gave him his knife, the same one he once cut all the buttons off his best suit with. Dicky gave him his prize naval heroes, because it was the best thing he had, and Noel gave him a piece of poetry he had made himself. When sin and shame bow down the brow, then people feel just like we do now. We are so sorry with grief and pain. We will never be so ungentlemanly again. Lord Tottenham seemed very pleased. He thanked us and talked to us for a bit, and when he said good-bye, he said, All's fair weather now, mates, and shook hands. And whenever we meet him, he nods to us, and if the girls are with us, he takes off his hat. So he can't really be going on thinking us ungentlemanly now. End of chapter 10